Hey there, I'm Pastor Darrell. Welcome to Mount Moriah. It is awesome. It is awesome to hear life in here. Um, it, there are certain Sundays where when I'm, I'm sitting there, I can hear the band sing. Um, or I don't even think we call them a band. We call them the worship team. I don't, what do we call them? Um, so you can hear them and, and the rest of it kind of fades out. But there are mornings like this morning where I don't know whether it's my ears are, are more perceptive or my spirit is more perceptive. But just hearing you, uh, God's congreg- congregation, just just speaking out. I don't know. You guys get to see it. I got my back to most of it. But it just felt like there was something more powerful this morning. And it's not because of what we do. It's, it's because of how we've prepared ourselves oftentimes. Um, it's how we've come in uh, expecting God to do something great uh, in us, with us, uh, and even sometimes for us. So, uh, you know, so this morning uh, it was kind of a, a different type of, of Kind of different kind of morning uh, for us at, at our house. We're, we were a little bit more tired, a little bit more uh, kind of, I don't even know what you call it, in a funk. You, you guys ever get in those funks? Um, and so you come in, and it's just been so uplifting this morning. And then I'm going to tell you something like this. Don't worry. <laughs> so here's what I really wanted to do, but they've, they've asked, well, actually asked me not to ever sing from up here. I, I wanted to go to the Bobby McFerrin song, right? And, and you can thank me for this the rest of the day as you're singing it over and over in your head. Um, don't worry, be happy. Everybody, you know that song. Uh, it was annoying for the time that it was being played, and it really is kind of there still today. Uh, but it'll be a song that you'll be singing all day long. But I want us, by the end of today's message, I want us to change some of the words to that song. Not because I want copyright infringement or anything like that, but because I think it's more important for us to understand where uh, this joy or where this happiness or where this content feeling uh, can come from, even in the midst of, of what we're all experiencing. Um, you know, it's strange because we, we think uh, a year and a half, almost two years ago, when all of this stuff began, and I don't even have to mention what it is, but uh, when all of this stuff began, people began to be concerned. Uh, people began to worry. People began to have fear in their lives. And, and it looked as though as we continued uh, through this process that it was going to begin to fade and go away. And, uh, and now it just resurges and it goes back and forth. And you know what? There's an answer for all of this. There really is. And it, and it has nothing to do uh, with what we're doing physically outside in the world. It, it really has nothing to do w- with what uh, our, our uh, leaders are, are saying or doing. It really has nothing to do with what I'm even doing or saying in, in and of myself or what you're going to do in and of yourself. It's going to be something that's going to be changed from the inside out. And I totally believe that. And I totally uh, want you to understand that when we say... As a Christian church, when we say as a Christian people, don't worry, we're not saying to stop thinking about what's going on around us. We're not telling you to do that because in this life, it tells us throughout Scripture that we're going to suffer, we're going to have persecution, there's going to be afflictions, um, and, and just like Sunday school, wow, what an encouraging message. We're starting off really good. But all of those things seem to overwhelm us and they draw our attention and our focus off where they really need to be. And I'm here to tell you, as Christians, if we're focused on the problems, we're going to have more. When we begin to focus on the suffering and the persecution, it's going to become more and it's going to get bigger and bigger in our lives. And so we need to hear the message of don't worry a lot. And it's sad that we do, but we need to hear it over and over again. I had a professor that he would go over and do different reviews, uh, and you would be reviewing on the last week of class something that you did in the first week of class, and you're like, we're paying for this. And you're still talking about the same thing that you talked about when we first got here. And the reason is is because as he would go through the class, things would begin to soak in, and they soaked in better and better as he would reinforce them. And, And so sometimes we've read passages like we are here this morning. We've read those two years ago. And then we've gotten to the point where we're not focused on that any longer. We're focused more on something else. So I'm bringing us back. I'm going to bring us back, and we're hopefully going to stick 
uh, here a little bit. We're going to stick to the point where it is going to change us from the inside out. Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 33 is the passage that we're going to look at this morning. Um, and we're going to look at that passage fairly deep, um, but it's, going to, it's hopefully going to make a difference when we, uh, when we walk out of here uh, this morning. So here's what it is. Uh, what do we have to worry about? <laughs> Anybody want to volunteer? No, that's okay. <laughs> Where do we start, right? What do we have to worry about? So I, I was curious. So uh, most of the time when you uh, come up to somebody and, and you say, you know what, you really shouldn't worry, what's the, what do they say? Well, I'm not really worried. It's not worried. I'm, I'm just a little concerned. You get, you get that? You, you say that occasionally? It's not that I'm worried because we do have this stigma nowadays that if you're worried about something, it's wrong. And it is if it goes to the point of anxiety. Uh, I'm not making light of that. But, but we won't even admit it. I'm just a little stressed out. You know, that's kind of how my morning felt this morning. I'm just a little stressed out. You ever come to church or, or go anywhere, <laughs> live in, in that uh, state? Uh, I just have a lot on my plate right now. That, that is an expression, whether we realize it or not, that we're, we're worried. Um, I can't stop thinking about it. That's a, a good indicator that you're worried. Um, it's been keeping me awake at night. Anybody sleepless nights? Um, because of stuff that's going on around you. or it just makes me nervous. I'm not worried. I'm just a little nervous. Um, and then we get to these points where we begin to understand what's really happening. You know, I dread going to work today. I dread talking to that person today. I dread having to do this or do that. Or, you actually use the word that begins to bring it into perspective. I dread this. Man, that's the last place I want to go. That's the last person I want to see. If these are thoughts or things that are occurring in your mind, then you're worrying, whether you realize it or not. You know, I've got a lot of people in my life, they say, oh, I'm, not, I'm not a worrier. <laughs> but I hear things like this come out of their mouth more often and more often. And it's because we begin to focus more on our situations. We begin to focus more on our circumstances. We begin to focus more on people. We begin to focus more on ourselves. And, and when we begin to do that, the more we focus on those things that, that aren't, the more we focus on those things that aren't edifying, building us up, the more we feel ourselves being destroyed deteriorated. We don't feel like the person maybe that we once were. We don't feel like the person that we want to be. Worry has that effect on us. Well, since none of us worry, let's look at what other people might worry about. I love doing this, going through uh, lists uh, of things like these because, uh, you know, uh, me not being a worrier, I need, to, I need to have some knowledge, right? So here's what you think about, uh, and this could be an exhaustive list, but I don't think it is. Here's the things that people are worried about. Crime levels in the area I live in. Maybe. This one kind of made me chuckle. My pet's health. That's in the top 46%. Can you believe that? <laughs> Some people can, right? Yeah, duh. Um, top 46%. How I'm dressed. How am I dressed this morning? <laughs> and I, that, our family goes through that all the time. You sure this looks okay? Only because I really understand that I can't dress myself. Meeting work expectations. That one's a little bit real, right? That one hits a little bit closer to home. I, I could agree with that one. I could see where that would be. Top 46%. Am I a good parent? Worry about that? Top 46% falling out with friends or family. I could see that one, right? Top 46% will I find the right person or is the person I am with now the right one? Does my spouse still love me? Am I attractive? <laughs> Which kind of goes with the dressed part, I thought, but, but it's, a different, it's a different worry. Will I or do I need to find a new job? Am I happy? Will the bills get paid this month? What about my physical appearance? 
these wrinkles or the aging appearance? How about job security, financial or credit card debt, diet, energy levels, savings for financial future, or just simply getting old? All of those are in the top 46% of what people are worried about. And I'm guessing that some of those, they don't even touch what some of the concerns that are on your hearts and on your minds might be. I'm guessing some of those might be exactly what some of you are experiencing or, or concerned about. Not that we're worried, but the list that it basically boils down to, and I've boiled it down to a few Fs. It's your future. It's what the future of not only you as an individual, but maybe the future of our nation. Maybe it's the future of your company. Maybe it's the future of your relationships. It's the unknown that is before us that sometimes just overwhelms us or concerns us. It boils down to a family or a relationship. More people worry about how their family is established or or what's in store for their family in the near future, in the far future, and even sometimes what they're experiencing now or maybe have experienced in the past. But family is a big thing to worry about, according to most of these studies. Finances is huge, and we understand, and most of us understand what it is to be financially pinched at one point or another in our lives. Some of us may be at a point now where we're financially stable, but there's the market, right? Oh, did you have to bring that up? I just stopped thinking about it. There's always the investments that we have. It's always the investments that maybe we want to make. But there's a lot of fear and worry involved in our finances. Why? Because we feel that we're dependent upon them. How about your failing health? You ever notice that most people don't worry about good health? <laughs> you know, we don't, when we're feeling good, we don't usually think, wow, I wonder what it would be like if I don't feel good. <laughs> But when we're feeling bad, it's always, man, am I ever going to feel good again, right? So there's a lot of worry there. And the last F that I think that it boils down to is failures of the past. We can't just quite get past that. So something that just about all of these that we can't do a whole lot about. Most of them are decisions that somebody else makes or, or expectations that someone else has. But we get to the point where now we are the ones that feel the crunch of it. I'm looking around and I'm seeing that some of, the, some of you people know exactly what I'm talking about here. And some of you feel it just like I do and just like our families do and just like everybody else in America and really across the world. Worry is something that everybody deals with. It's something that Jesus knew everybody was going to deal with. And so he addresses it. So what does Matthew chapter 6, 24, or 25 through 33 read? It says, this is why I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or, what your, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father, he feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add a single cubit to his height by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Learn, learn how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? You have little faith. So don't worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the idolaters eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Father God, when we look at this passage It's so easy to read. It's so easy for us to sit there and see someone like Jesus who was God, fully human, fully God, perfect. It's so easy for us to just blow this off and say, well, of course, Jesus understood he was perfect. But God, his disciples didn't understand. 
God, we have trouble understanding. And the reason why is identified plainly is that there is a lack of faith. It's not that we don't have any faith, but God, it is when the things that we are worried about begin to grow so big in our hearts and our minds that that our faith just kind of gets squashed or pushed off to the side. So God, help us this morning identify maybe what those things are in our lives that we need to turn over to you. And then God, allow us to hear what Jesus is really saying in this passage. God, I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So Jesus identifies worry as the result of having little faith. I mean, he just plainly says this. And I like this sometimes because we dance around little things like that, right? Uh, We think that every problem we have is physical. We think every problem we have is emotional. But Jesus identifies this problem of worry. All the things that are going on around you, he identifies them as it being a spiritual problem. Now, we don't always like to hear that. (laughs) Because if there's one place that we would like to have it all together, most of the time as Christians, is we would like to say we're spiritual people. (laughs) We got it spiritually all together. And I think that's why the world sometimes looks at us and says, "Eh, I'm not quite buying it. So we have to learn how to do this a little bit differently. not saying it's going to change overnight because I don't believe that it it will. I believe that it will take hard work and it will take uh, the exercising of our faith to to begin to bring this into a, a completion But when we look at it, it, this idea of having little faith, it's not a huge concept. It's just simply we doubt God's ability to protect and provide for us, or, or we don't believe that he wants what's best for his children. That's what little faith boils down to. We either believe he can't do it, or he doesn't want to do it. And when we get our minds into this, this set of believing those two things, then God is no longer awesome. We're just bringing him down to the level of everybody else on this earth. At the best, at the best, the greatest person you know on this earth. So this little faith has this concept of just God doesn't or can't. And I don't believe the Bible teaches us any of those things. I believe that the Bible teaches us that God can do the impossible, that God can do anything and everything that he wants to do. So today's passage, Jesus believes the exact same thing, and he says, don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about your life. The first thing Jesus wants us to look at is how much do you think you're worth? And that's where part of this starts. Part of us don't think that we're worth what we're worth. Part of us have this idea that we're just not good enough or, or, or we're just not important enough or we're not significant enough. And, and so we convince ourselves that everything that we're experiencing we've either deserved or, or we've earned or, or it's just the way it's going to be because that's who I am. But this is who we are. Think about how much you're worth. Jesus assures us that we are worth more than at least two things in this world. And I believe when he uses these two things, the category stretches beyond our imagination. He uses the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. Now we look at that and say, well, those are some pretty simple comparisons. But And, and I would hope that we're worth more than that, right? Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe we do and maybe we don't. Some people have this idea that I'm just simply worth. Jesus does not see us that way. It may seem a bit unnecessary to point this out, but I want us to think all the way back to creation. When you think to day three, God speaks plants into existence. When we look at day five, God speaks birds into existence. But on day six, it was just a little bit different. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 27, this is how it is described. This begins to give you our value, what we are worth, and this is what God's word says. Then God said, let us make man, let us make human beings in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over the creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Well, yeah, we've read that before. We've heard that before. But do you see what 
God is identifying with us here. He's giving us his image, his own likeness. He's given that to no other part of creation. Every other part of creation was the result of his creativity. But we are a result and a reflection, a representation of God's image. That makes us worth so much more. That makes us worth so much more. How are humans different in this passage from the plants and the animal? It's not just the image that we were created in God's image, but it was the authority and the power and the control that we were given over everything else. God said, I've not only created you in my image, but I'm going to give you some of the responsibility. I'm going to give you some of the power and the authority that I have so that you can go out and you can be like me. You can be like me. There's a description of, uh, that is just so much different. That, so are we better than the birds of the field? God's image says yes. Are we better than, than the, the flowers in the, in the field? God's word says yes because he's given us the authority and the power over those things. David describes the care that was given into the forming of each of our bodies individually. Some of us get this idea, well, yeah, that was Adam and Eve. They were created to be perfect. They were created in God's image. But, but does that still exist? Is God that involved or intimate in the, the relationship of how we are formed? Psalm 139, my favorite psalm without a shadow of a doubt, tells us in verse 13, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in the secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. God intimately put you together in your mother's womb. Nowhere in Scripture does it describe any other animal being put together quite so intricately. Nowhere in creation does it show that God was so involved with humans, with people, you're so much more valuable. And Jesus said, you're, you're concerned? Because if you, would, if you would understand how I've created this world to work, you would understand that I'm going to care for you, that I'm going to provide for you, that I'm going to protect you, just like I do for all of the other creation, even more so. So we think about how much we're worth. I think the other thing Jesus is really asking us here is to think about who loves you. If we look at who loves us, Scripture again is the place where we really need to understand the value in our worth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have an everlasting or eternal life. When we look at that verse, sometimes we just skip over it. We don't really understand what's being said there. God so loved the world, God so loved you, that he gave in exchange for you. He gave in exchange for you his son. That exchange means when I go to the store, if something says that it's $2.99, I pull out of my pocket something that is worth at least $2.99. If I pull out a five, I'm going to get change. <laughs> but I pull out at least what it is worth, right? At the very least. So when God says that he gave his son, the exchange is your value, your worth at the very least is Jesus. Your worth, Jesus. That's incredible. You want to worry about something. You don't understand how much you're worth. You don't understand how much God loves you and what he's given for you. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. If I would need to give my life for someone else, the person who's on the other side taking that life has to at least understand that my life is equal value. Or it's not going to happen, or it's not going to happen the way we expect, right? 
But in laying my life down, what I'm saying is, is you're worth my life. Jesus says, I'm laying down my life for my friends. You are my friends, is what he declares to believers, to Christians, to God's children. Romans chapter 5, 5 through 9 is another scripture that really brings into perspective as to how much we are worth by understanding who loves us. It says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners Christ died for us guess what that just takes another perspective out of it well you know what I might be worth something if I'm good I might be worth all that if I'm doing the right things or I'm believing the right things or uh, I'm involved with the right things but this tells us that God loved us enough to send Jesus to die for us we were worth it even before we were good before we did the right things We were worth to God, his son. You see, Jesus reminds us that we're worth more to God than anything else in this creation, and God will take care of his children. One commentator put it like this, referring back to Israel, God's care for his people has not diminished over time. He holds his children close, and he can protect us as easily as our eyelids protect our pupils. He does this because he loves us in Christ. He has a parental protective love for us. And the biblical descriptions of his love are eye-opening to say the least. When we see the biblical descriptions of God's love for his children, and we look at this passage and, and doubt just a little bit God's love for us, then there is an issue. There's a problem. But we are assured, Jesus assures us, that as his children, God will protect, God will provide, God will love us. So what can worrying do? Jesus is being somewhat sarcastic when he asks, and I like when Jesus is being somewhat sarcastic, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Now, the translations are different. One of them says a a cubit to their height, which is about 18 inches. Any of you, I'm looking around, there might be a few of you that have 18 inches left. Uh, But for the most of us, we're pretty much done. (laughs) Who can add an 18 inches to to their height? Not one of us. Now, that's sarcastic. But what it's a figurative language for is who can add one minute? Or who can add one moment on to the length of their life? You know, we do it. We try, don't we? Hey, if I eat right, you start worrying about your diet. If I eat right, well, then I could add a couple years. And our doctors kind of define it like that, right? They say, well, you know what? If you don't get, you don't get this straightened out, um, you're, you only got six months, seven months, nine months, ten years. Uh, you, you're, you're not going to live much longer. Your doctor doesn't know. Uh, I can give you that. I've seen people who have been diagnosed with with cancer uh, that the doctor says five years tops, and it's 15 years later, and that person is still here. The doctor doesn't know. But that person spent the first 10 years worrying uh, about that. And then as they they pass that point, it's kind of cool because you see all of a sudden, hey, you know what, it's not up to the doctor. And it's not. It's not. It's not up to your diet. Although we should do everything we can to be healthy. I'm not saying just give up on it. (laughs) Not saying that. Because, man, we would all be worried a little bit more about our uh, physical appearance, right? (laughs) Some of us would be. But what it is is it's this idea that we can do something or we can change something about our lives by worrying a bit about it. So I decided, is there any benefit whatsoever about worrying? So I looked it up. Of course, you have to Google it. You have to do go wherever you want. Now, I don't just take anybody's advice because the first like five or six are usually ads, and they want to, they want me to buy something, so they're going to tell me what I want, right? So you go back until you get into these ones that are like EDUs, 
Those ones are usually a little bit more uh, reliable sometimes. So you get into the EDUs and really, uh, so I found this one benefit that we have. And, and it refers to the eating part. And re eating is usually where I kind of start and finish anyways. So what it says is when it comes, um, when it comes to being anxious, can you add to add time to your life. Well, here's the benefit. When it comes to your health, there is something good to say about worries and what they refer to as repetitive thoughts. It's both the same thing. Worrying and repetitive thinking about your health might eventually translate into behaviors that are health promoting. So there is an idea of this repetitive thinking that if I think I'm going to eat right, I'm going to eat right, and then eventually you receive the benefits of eating right. There, that, and that makes sense to me. Uh, I don't know if worry's really doing any, any of that work, but, but it does kind of create maybe a, an idea that we're more uh, conscious of what we're doing, and so we do things differently. And that can give us healthier life. It can give us, uh, it can give us more benefits. However, most studies show that anxiety has been found to do adversely affect, um, uh, adversely affect uh, our physical, emotional, and social health. Um, so when we worry, uh, it's been proven that our heart rates go up and our heart starts to have to work harder. And as that continues, of course, it begins to weaken things. And, and so anxiety does that. It, that's that's kind of one of the physical things that we get. You know, emotionally, when you worry, um, you're not thinking about the good things. So you become more depressed. You become sad. That's kind of a result of being a worrier. Uh, some of us might identify with that or understand that. But most of us, do you understand it's even a social health thing? Socially, it's unhealthy to be a worrier because as we begin to worry, one of two things happens. Either other people don't want to be around you <laughs> because that's all you're concerned about, or you begin to feel ashamed or embarrassed, and so you begin to isolate yourself. So socially, there's a adverse effects to being worriers. So how does this all work? Well, the Bible teaches that you can't add one minute. Not one, either way, whether it be physical uh, worrying, emotionally worrying, socially worrying, none of that really helps because in Job chapter 14, verse 5, Job comes to the realization that you've decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live, and we are not given a minute longer. You know, it's a reality, and sometimes people think I'm trying to be smart about this, but when somebody passes away, my loved ones, your loved ones, one of the greatest comforts that I have is that that person did not die a minute before they were supposed to, and they did not die a minute after they were supposed to. God knew when that moment was going to occur, and that moment was set, according to Job 14, verse 5. That moment was set. So why do we worry about it? Why do we worry about it? Because we are afraid of being alone. We're afraid, afraid of being depressed. Some of us are afraid that we don't know where we're going to go when we die. There's a, a lot of things that involve with that. And that's why it's important for us to live right now. That's why it's important for us to live for right now. We can't change what happened in the past. We're certainly going to be able to do things that might affect what's going to happen in the future. But we're not going to change that. It might affect it. But when we die, it's just like the day we were born, not determined by anyone else but Jesus. It's not going to be changed by anybody else but Jesus. Well, I had a C-section. I didn't personally have a C-section. That would be ridiculous. Our doctor scheduled a C-section. This is the funny part about this C-section. The doctor said, this is the day we're going to have Tasso. We actually agreed on it because we didn't want Tasso to have his birthday on the same day as his niece or his cousin. So uh, we, we went into great detail. We wanted it to happen on this day. So they were going to in, uh, induce labor on the morning of the, help me, 17th. They were going to do, yeah, I know it's funny, but it's been a long weekend. So... So they are going to induce him on the 17th in the morning. Joyce and I are sitting in the hospital at about 1 o'clock in the morning, and Joyce's water breaks. That's not supposed to happen. If you know doctors, and I like putting this out there, only 10% uh, of women, according to our doctor, uh, have their water break on its own. I know that's way too much detail for some people, but this is a great story. So uh, we were in planning on having Tasso on the 17th, but Tasso decided, uh, 
God decided that that was the day, and we had nothing to do with it. He put it in motion. Even though we picked the right day, it was just luck. No, it was just, I don't know what it was, that we... But Tossett was coming on the 17th, whether we wanted him on the 16th or whether we wanted him on the 18th. He was coming when God brought him here. And guess what? It's sobering for us, but the day that Tosso is to go to be with the Lord, it's already set in stone. We're not worried about it because he knows Jesus. There's nothing to worry about. Now, the process is he's kind of like me. We're, don't, we're worried or concerned about the process, but we know what God has in store for us. And that's the way we should be teaching our kids. We shouldn't be teaching them to worry about these things, but to be confident. God's not done with you because you're here. And he's going to continue to use you. So don't worry. Be happy. (laughs) I had to say it again. Jesus has got something better. What Jesus says is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Everything that you're concerned or worried about, Jesus has got it, right? Uh, It's a big thing in our Christian school, Mount Moriah Christian School. When there's a little thing that we're not sure about, don't worry, God's got this. Am I right? Isn't that what we do? Right? Don't worry, God's got this. We've got some of the teachers in here. They'll, they'll back us up. So when we understand that, that God's got it, we don't have to be obsessed with all the earthly stuff. If you're a child of God, Paul reminds us this, Colossians 3, 1 through 3. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden in Christ in God, with Christ in God. The word hidden there isn't just that we're being hidden with him, but what that means is God is actively, God is actively involved in protecting us and providing for us. When God hides us, there's food, there's, uh, there's shelter, there's everything that we need. So we don't have to worry when we're hidden in Christ. This is where we find our protection. This is what we desperately need and we desperately seek here on earth when we are warriors. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That rest is provision and protection. It's a, low, it's a knowing that God has got this, that Jesus has already made uh, has already made all the necessary arrangements for what you're experiencing and what you're going through. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, 7 through 10. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. But stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the exact same kind of sufferings that you are. And in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you've suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. Don't worry. Trust Jesus. Don't worry. Trust Jesus. Jesus tells us that we are worth so much more to God than for just coincidence to happen. We're worth so much more to God. He loves us so much more than just to allow things to happen here and there frivolously. He has a purpose for your life. One of the videos that we've watched in Wednesday night, one of the quotes at the very end is the lady says, if God wants to keep us safe, he will keep us safe. And it's not that he wants to see us to come to destruction But what that means is here on earth, as long as God wants us to be protected and provided for, we have the confidence that he will do so. But when he is done protecting and providing for you here, he's got a hope that is much greater in heaven for you, an eternal life where there'll be no more tears of pain, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more suffering. And we will spend eternity with God because of Christ Jesus. Don't worry. Trust Jesus. And if you need to do that, begin that process today. It's as simple as this. 
You turn from your sin and your selfishness, all the things that you're worried about, and you bring those to Jesus, and you say, I trust that you died for my sins, and I trust that you will protect and provide for me, and in the best way I know how, I'm not only asking for forgiveness, but I'm surrendering my life to you in faith. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit comes in, and you are hidden. You are hidden in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Uh, I don't know if it's going to keep us from worrying, but God, it at least lets us know that we don't have to. So God, I ask this morning that you would just simply do that, that you would help us to put our faith and our trust in you, and that God, we wouldn't be a people of little faith, allowing all of the worries and the concerns and the situations to affect how we feel and believe about you. But God, we would allow what we, what we believe about you to affect the way we think about the things here on earth so that, God, we can live with confidence, we can live with hope, we can live with the idea and with the realization that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And if we put our faith in you, we put our faith in Christ that we get to spend eternity with him. God, help us to understand these things and then help us to live these things as we put our faith in you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.